Well, if last week was last words, then this week we're going to look at some first words. Some first words that God speaks through his prophet, Jeremiah. And so if you've got a Bible, open it up to Jeremiah chapter 2. That's where we're going to be spending some of our time this morning. Jeremiah chapter 2. But while you turn there, just because I love doing the children's moment and it gets them in the mood, and just to set the stage for the way that this Sunday is going to go, we're going to do a little activity like I love to do with the kids. I just said, everybody go, because they were surprised. I want to see your shocked faces. So give me a shocked face like, whoa. Now look at your neighbor and do the shock face like you haven't seen him in 10 years and they just walked through your front door. <gasps> wow, oh, yes. Super exciting, shocked face, right? Well, there's different times in our lives that we make that kind of face. Maybe you've seen something amazing or maybe it was a tragic event. You saw a really horrific car accident or maybe you were in an accident and you're just like, whoa, what just happened there? Maybe you're surprised by some news, whether bad news or good news. Well, there's different times that you make these faces of being just in utter awe and shock. Well, I kind of had one of these experiences earlier this week when I saw what NASA released from the new Webb telescope. If you've seen some of these pictures, they've been on the news and everything. And so we've got one for you. And I don't necessarily know the names, but uh, take a look at this picture that the Webb telescope took for us just released a couple weeks ago or this last week. That is just a small piece of our universe. When I first saw that, I was shocked. I said, wow, that is beautiful. Seeing the stars and the vastness of our universe, it should shock us. And it should take, it cause us to take a step back and to remember how small we really are. Every single mighty kingdom throughout history, every great general, every expensive yacht and every great castle and every cool spaceship that we've ever created, all the fastest computers, every meaningful relationship that we've ever had has existed on a small piece of dust that's floating around in space that looks like that. And just because we haven't been able to see it every day doesn't mean it hasn't been there. That's been there all along. And everything about humanity has existed on a little rock floating in God's universe. And there's a reason that these stars are there. Phil prayed this actually for us this morning out of Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. So we're supposed to look at that picture, and you're supposed to see the fingerprints of God. Look at His creativity. Look at His power. Who can just speak that into existence? Where He says, let there be, and then boom, stars and nebulas and galaxies and who knows what else is out there. God just made it happen by speaking it into existence. Think of the power of God who, it says that Jesus holds all things together. Every single one of those stars and all how gravity works, it's all held together by God, by Jesus Himself. We're supposed to look up and see the majesty, the glory, the power of God who holds the universe in the palm of His hand. It is such a small thing to Him. This is the God that we serve. But what I also think is amazing is not only God's power, but His particularity. His organization. See, if it, would me, if it was me, I would have just taken a bunch of stars and flung them out there and just left them. Because that's the kind of guy I am. But not God. He's like, no, no. Every single one of those stars, it's in just the right place at just the right time, and it has a name that I gave it. It has a unique name that I gave it. I think we found one. This is Billy the Bright. Now, I don't know if that's what God calls stars, 
But I imagine just because I made that joke, like before he created all things, he probably named that star Billy just to mess with us. We're going to get to heaven. He's like, oh yeah, no, that really was Billy. Um, we got it right. One in a gazillion chance and I nailed it. But listen to some of these verses. Psalm 147.4 says, He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. In Isaiah 40.26, it says, Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name. Billions and billions and billions of stars, and every single one of them God knows. God has named personally. And the stars are there for a reason, so that they could proclaim His handiwork. And the stars, they should shock us. Every time we see a picture like that, we should stand back in awe and make our face go like, wow, wow. Not necessarily at the stars, but at the God who created them. But the next time you look up into space and you see the stars and you see how they glorify God, remember that they actually also look back down at you. And that's in our passage today. That the stars are not just there to declare God's glory. That is what they do. But they're also there to look back at us when we stare at them. And let's find out how they react when they see who we are and what is done on our small speck of dust. Before we jump into our passage, I'd like to pray and ask that God would just open up His truth to us. So would we pray just one more time? Let's pray together. Lord, we thank You for your word that comes to us and can speak truth into our hearts and into our minds. And as we look up into the stars, we do, we give you glory. We give you praise. And we are in awe of your majesty. Lord, that is nothing compared to who you are in your character, in your nature. And Lord, I pray that your word today would meet us where we're at in our hearts and our minds and would draw us to yourself and help us to see more of you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let me start by reading Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 1 is where we'll begin today. So Jeremiah 2, 1. The word of the Lord came to me, saying... And I'm going to pause there. I know we didn't get very far, but hold on. The word of the Lord came to me, saying. Now, it's important that we know who it is that's speaking, who he's speaking to, and what's the context around this before we listen to these first words. So this is obviously out of the book of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah is a prophet who finds himself within the history of Israel. To where if we were to start back where Pastor John is leading us through Genesis with Joseph, if that's going to be our starting point, then, uh, spoiler alert, but Joseph's whole family ends up with him in Egypt. I know we haven't gotten that far yet, but it's going to happen. The rest of his family will meet him in Egypt. And then, for over 400 years, they grow as a nation in Egypt, much of the time spent as slaves to the Egyptians, and they're suffering greatly. Well, they cry out to God, and then God sends a Savior, Moses. Moses comes down and he rescues his people through a series of miracles and God just showing off his might and his power. And he leads his people through the Red Sea and they get the Ten Commandments. They get the instructions on how to live with God, how to build the tabernacle and how to have priests and what to wear, what to eat, what not to eat, all the different things they can do to live with God. Well, then after Moses, you have Joshua that actually leads them into the promised land that God had promised to Abraham so many years before. And then they conquer much of the land. And then when Joshua dies, he gives them that great challenge. He says, hey, you guys, you can decide who you want to serve, either the Lord who's led us here or these other gods of these false religions that are scattered around us. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Well, you quickly find out that the people 
they chose the first option, and they started worshiping the gods that were surrounding them. Well, not all of them, but a lot of them. So God sent judges that were a series of just rescuing people. They would rescue from the enemies, and God would keep his people safe. But then, after the judges, you have the kings, where God calls out King Saul, then King David, then King Solomon. And then after King Solomon, there's this horrible civil war. Israel breaks off to the north. Judah breaks off to the south. And now we essentially have two different kingdoms. And in the north, they go evil right away, and they stay evil the entire time, essentially. All their kings lead them further and further into idolatry, and God destroys them with the nation of Assyria. But then, the south, they occasionally have some good kings and occasionally have some bad kings. But overall, they've been kind of unfaithful to the Lord as well. And so now, a few you know, uh, decades or so after the Assyrians have destroyed the north and Israel, Babylon has come to destroy the south, Judah, including the capital city of Jerusalem, which is where Jeremiah lives. And Jeremiah's job now as the prophet of God is to announce the coming doom and judgment of God. God gives this task to Jeremiah. It's a lovely job description. Go tell these people that I'm going to destroy the temple that they have built for me. Go tell this people that the city of Jerusalem that they love so much is going to be conquered and burned to the ground. Go tell this people that if they're fortunate enough to survive, they'll be carried away as slaves. And almost everyone you know will be dead in a very short amount of time. In fact, Jeremiah, your job is so bad, God tells him, don't get married. You do not want to bring a family into existence during this time. I don't want you to get married. don't want you to have kids. Because it's going to be so much suffering going on around you. That might break you. So Jeremiah, don't have a family. This is what God has called Jeremiah to do. This is the context in which he is working. And so this first word from the Lord to his people through Jeremiah are his first words of judgment and condemnation. So let's read and see what God has to say to his people in Jerusalem. So I'll just start in verse 1 again. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord. I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness, in a land not sown. Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest. All who ate of it incurred guilt. Disaster came upon them, declares the Lord. I'm going to pause there. See, God, he starts with the good old times. He goes, you guys remember? Remember how I led you up out of Egypt and and how I was with you? You remember how I did all these amazing miracles through Moses and in the times of Joshua and in the times of the judges and that like a small army would defeat a huge army. Like I have been with you and been faithful to you over and over again. I've rescued you and you've been my people You were like my bride. I loved you. I cared for you. I protected you. God wants them to remember how they were when they were young as a nation. And they were trusting in God. Now, they were certainly not perfect when they were walking around in the wilderness. And when God led them out of Egypt. They didn't get it all right. But at least they were turning to the Lord for help and for guidance. And they'd find times of repentance. And they'd cry out to God for rescue. God God says, do you remember that? How you followed me? But like Hosea's unfaithful bride, Gomer, God's bride went seeking after other gods, other loves, and abandoned the Lord, her husband. They'd left the God who is in their midst. And so they had forgotten who God is to them. So God continues, and he calls out judgment against them. Let's pick it up in verse 4. 
Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the clans of the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, What wrong did your fathers find in me that they went far from me and went after worthlessness and became worthless? They did not say, Where is the Lord who brought us up from the land of Egypt, who led us in the wilderness, in a, de- in a land of deserts and pits, in a land of drought and deep darkness, in a land that none passes through, where no man dwells? And I brought you into a plentiful land to enjoy its fruits and its good things. But when you came in, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. The priests did not say, where is the Lord? Those who handle the law did not know me. The shepherds transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and went after things that do not profit. Therefore, I still contend with you, declares the Lord. And with your children's children, I will contend. For cross to the coasts of Cyprus and see. Or send to Keter and examine with care. See if there has been such a thing. Has a nation changed its gods, even though they are no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked. Be utterly desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. That is a difficult passage to read in our day. Imagine hearing that as a citizen of Jerusalem with Babylon, your enemy, knocking on the door. And that's what you hear from the Lord. So if you start at verse 5, what is the accusation that God brings against His people? He asks a question. What wrong did your fathers find in me that they went far from me? It's as if God is saying, hey, what did I do to hurt you? What did I do that was so bad, so wrong? You remember, I rescued you out of Egypt. I was your God. I dwelt with you. I loved you. You were precious to me. What did I do that was so offensive to you, my people, my bride, that caused you to go look for other loves? The answer, of course, is God did nothing wrong. And yet they were still unfaithful. Then God starts asking more questions. Like, did you guys come into the land and and say, hey, what's wrong with this land? This land that God promised us. It's not very good. We came out of the wilderness of drought and, you know, there's no water and there's no food and nothing. And here we are. We're in this great pasture land where it's flowing with milk and honey. And, oh, there's just too much food, too much water. And God's like, it was a pretty nice place, wasn't it? And then you go and you ruin it because of your disobedience. So God's like, what was wrong with the land I gave you? And the answer is nothing. Nothing was wrong with it. And yet they disobey God and they defile it. And then God calls the priests and says, hey, the priests, you guys came and you're supposed to minister before me in the tabernacle and represent me to the people. Name a time, God says, where a priest came in and said, Hey, God, we need your help. And it was silent, as if I wasn't there. Did a priest ever come back to you and say, I guess, God's busy, I guess. Like, we've got nothing. And he said he can't help us. He says he's not strong enough. He says he doesn't love us anymore. He says he doesn't want anything to do with us. When the priests go to God and say, Lord, be gracious to us. God says, I was gracious. I met with you. I was always there. I never abandoned you. You guys just stopped coming around and you stopped asking the questions. Stopped seeking me. So God says, ask the priests. (laughs) Excuse me. That hasn't happened. So then God, in verse 9, says, Therefore, 
I still contend with you. Much like when God came to Job and says, hey, dress yourself like a man. For I now have a question for you. You've been complaining to me and you guys, Israel or Job, you've had all these complaints. Now it's my turn, God says, and I will contend with you. It's as if you're in a courtroom and God is the prosecutor. I don't know. I'm sure it was frightening for Job. Sure, it was frightening for the Israelites. But could you imagine even you finding yourself in a courtroom with God as your prosecutor? Where he says, I will contend with you now. It's your turn to answer some of my questions. What are you going to do in your defense? It's not like you can lie your way out of it. God knows what you were doing. You can't be sneaky about it. He was there. He saw it. He even knows in your heart. So you can't get away with like, well, that wasn't really my motive. God's like, yeah, no, it was. I know. I know you better than you know yourself. Who's going to come and stand on your side and be a defender on your behalf? Who's going to stand up to God and say, God, no, no, I think you got this one wrong. Nobody's going to do that. If God were your prosecutor, what hope could you have? And so God calls His people to stand trial. And He will contend with them. So then He uses some illustrations to prove His point. And I love illustrations. That's why I love the prophets of the Old Testament. as They always spoke in word pictures. So you guys get to play along this morning. So here's the first word picture. And I'll tell you why we're going to do it in a minute. But what I want everybody to do is just to raise their hand and keep it in the air. I know, it's like a Sure commercial from years ago. Um, so keep your hand in the air and just wait. But God here, he says in verse 10, he says, cross over to the coast of Cyprus, a different area. Go look to Keter, a different people group. And I want you to examine them. So God calls his people to look around and to look at what else is happening. And he says, what of those nations has ever changed their gods? Where they said, you know what? The gods that we serve, eh, not doing it for us. Let's get new ones. He goes, they don't do that. And they're not even real gods. I love how God slips that in there. They're not even real. And they're still faithful to their imaginary gods. And I see the hands starting to get tired. And so let me tell the story of why they're in the air. Because I think God could come to us today and say a very similar condemnation. Where if you were to look around at the other religions of our world today, they may not be seeking after these false gods, but there's all kinds of people that are very faithful to their false religions. Think of the Mormons and their two-year mission trips that they go on. It's like on command, and they're just very dedicated people. Think of the Muslims. They, they sacrifice a lot. There's fasting and there's prayer during the days, and they face persecution in some of the places they live. But so Muslims, they're willing to give up much in their life to serve their God out of fear and reverence and obedience. Now, a few of you have made it. You still have your hands in the air. 1973. A Hindu man, in a way to honor his God, put his hand in the air. And he said, I will keep my hand in the air to promote peace and love from my God and to show that I am dedicated to him and I will not put it down. And for almost 50 years, his hand has not gone down. He's still alive today. You can Google it after the service. He says for two years, it was excruciating pain. For two years. And then all the nerves just died, and it went limp. And now his hand is a deformed mess. His bones are fused in place and he's over there in India today, and you can go talk to him, and he will tell you that he still has his hand in the air because he honors and values his God that much. You can put your hands down. For almost 50 years, his devotion has changed his life. He is utterly dependent on other people. 
utterly dependent on what he would say of his God's good graces. And God, he comes and he says, hey, look around. I'm the real God who really loves you. I desire to be with you and to just welcome you into my family. And these guys, they're worshiping false gods, gods that they created, they made themselves. Many of them worship them out of fear, not out of love. And yet look at them, they are faithful and you are not. That's a powerful image. God calls the enemies to witness against his own people. But then he calls not just the other enemies and their false gods. Verse 12, he calls Billy and the rest of the stars. Let's get that picture back up there. He says, hey, oh heavens, be appalled. Look down at my people. See what they're doing. I want you to be shocked. It's like God is just overwhelmed in a sense at the the sinfulness of His people. He's like, how can this be? What are you doing? What? And so I've got to share this. And so He calls all of the universe to His like, you know, watch party over the earth. And he goes, look at this. Look at my people. Can you see what they're doing? I've loved them. I've been faithful to them. I was with them and they've rejected me. And the stars are like, I don't know what face a star makes when it's shocked. Maybe it burns a little bit brighter. I don't know. But Billy is appalled at their behavior. And God calls them to bear witness against His people. The stars can hardly believe it. And so you're like, well, what's so appalling? Look at verse 13 again. He gets very specific. Verse 13. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. So here is our double trouble, our double evil. The two things that God holds against His people in Jerusalem. The first evil, He says, is that they have forsaken God, the fountain of living waters. See, we need water to survive. Everyone knows that. If you were to go a day or two without water, you'd start to feel it. And all of a sudden, nothing else would matter in life. If you were in a place, you're de- you know, deserted desert or lost in the wilderness, and you don't have access to water, nothing else matters. It doesn't matter the clothes that you're wearing or if you have good cell phone signal or you get to play a fun game. And, and to be honest, even the relationships you have, they seem much less important in that moment because you're like, I just need water to survive. I can't do anything else. All my hopes and dreams, all on hold. I need water. We need water. You would pay any amount of, of money to get water if you were dying of thirst. And so God gives this picture of His people dying of thirst, wandering in the desert. They're ragged, exhausted, and they're just like, water, (gasps) water. And then they see it, (gasps) water. And so they find this water, and God says, here I am. I have water. But God is not just a little water bottle. Like this, if you drank this, it'd keep you alive for maybe another day or two. But you know you'd need more. And so if you didn't have access to more, you'd be like, oh, I need more than this. This is good, but we could get better. And so God's like, no, I know I have more. I have more water for you. But then you're like, okay, yeah, that's good. But I, eh, I don't know. I think I need more, right? And then I got my different containers here. And if you were in the wilderness, all of a sudden you came across this big old thing of water, you'd be like, oh, yes. 
But what joy you would find if you got even this bigger one. Even more water. Where you'd be like, now I could like set up camp for a little bit and kind of hang out. But always in the back of your mind, you would know it's going to get lower eventually and run out. So God doesn't say He's just water. He says He's a fountain of life. A fountain of water that turns on and stays on. It's just there, flowing forever for you. And God is a never-ending flowing fountain of water. Forever meeting your need. Now here's the evil. (laughs) The people of God, they're dying of thirst. They come to this table. They take a look at all the water and this flowing fountain that will never run dry. And they're like, nah, no thanks. I don't want that. You know what I see over here? Oh, it's noisy water. I see this. I I, I think I could build my own well, make a cistern, which was like usually a big hole in the ground that they would store rainwater in. Or it could be a big pot, rain, barrel, that kind of thing. All that could be a cistern. Today I have just this small pot. And they would store water. And God says the people have committed two evils. First evil They've forsaken me as the fountain of living water. The second evil is they come over here and they try and dig for themselves their own cistern. And all they're finding is dust and dirt. And the cistern they have is broken. It wouldn't even hold water if you found water. It's a mess. And yet they keep coming back to this broken cistern looking for water when there's no water to be found. And they ignore the fountain that is freely available to them. God says they've committed these two evils. And that is what causes the stars to stand in awe and shock. When we reject the fountain, dig cisterns for ourselves, the stars stand appalled And they say, how incredibly insulting. How unfaithful can a people be? How ungrateful are they to the Lord who has loved them? What is the wickedness that is inside their heart that causes them to reject the Lord and turn to broken cisterns? Now, I think it's a double evil because it's one thing if you, you were thirsty but didn't know it. And you walked on by the fountain not knowing that it was the source of life and rescue for you. But the fact that they're digging holes looking for water means they knew they needed it. They knew they were in desperate need of something to save them. And they still rejected the water that God had to offer. And they try and find it for themselves. And I think that we do the same thing often today. We may not look to stone statues and other false gods that are surrounding us. But I think we dig our own broken cisterns looking for our meaning, our purpose, what's valuable in this life. We find our identity in other things outside of the Lord. And our culture, I think, is excellent at trying to find the water within instead of looking without. It's all about who I am and what I feel. And I am my own God. You're digging an empty cistern that is broken and will Hold no water if all you do is look within. When we think we are God, we reject the one true God of all things. And the galaxies stand in shock at that level of rebellion and self-destruction. 
And I think we should stand in shock and awe today as well. In fact, you could read the book of Ecclesiastes to get a whole list of things that we like to use as our broken cisterns. Wealth, success, parties, money, and all that it brings. I mean, you could go over and over again through that book and find all the broken cisterns that we try and fill our lives with meaning. And at the end, the author of Ecclesiastes, he calls it and says, it's meaningless, meaningless. It's all meaningless. Without the Lord, it's meaningless. Jesus, I think there were two times while he was doing ministry here on earth where he stood amazed, I would say, at a similar picture of a lack of faith in the people, how he was shocked that they could possibly think and be like this, where Jesus is shocked. Now, there are a lot of people that were shocked by what Jesus was doing, right? That happens over and over again in the Gospels, where he would heal somebody, raise the dead, and it says, wow, and they were all amazed at his power and his teaching. But I, as far as I can find, there are only two instances in the Gospels where it says that Jesus was shocked. The first one was in Mark chapter 6, verse 6, where Jesus is amazed at the lack of faith of the people in his hometown where he was doing miracles everywhere, and then he gets to his hometown, and he's like, I can do all of these things. Who is sick? Let me heal them. Who's blind? I'll give them sight. You know, what problems do you have? Let me come and rescue. Let me teach you and lead you and show you the kingdom of God. And yet the people, they reject him. And so Jesus is walking out of his hometown, and the, the verse says that he is amazed at their lack of faith. And the second time that Jesus is amazed and shocked is when the centurion has great faith. So he is amazed at somebody's faith in him, in where it actually stopped Jesus in his tracks. Where the centurion comes and says, hey, I want you to come do this miracle and heal. And Jesus says, okay, I'll go with you. And he goes, whoa, whoa, you don't need to come with me. Just say the word and it'll happen because I know who you are and what authority that you have. And Jesus is like, Whoa, now that is faith. And then here's where the judgment comes in because he looks around. He says, here he is, a Roman centurion. He's not even a Jew. And he has such great faith. What about my people? My people who knew I was coming, who had given the prophets and all of the scriptures, and yet you don't have that kind of faith? And so twice... Jesus is amazed, and both times it's in regards to whether or not we trust in the Lord. Do we go to the fountain of life, or do we reject Him and seek things on our own? So, this is the judgment that God brings to Jerusalem. But Jeremiah is not without hope. There is hope scattered throughout this book. Even as he's pronouncing the destruction of the city, the destruction of the temple, and utter desolation. Every time that God comes with a judgment case against his people, he filters in there a little bit of hope that all is not lost. So turn to Jeremiah chapter 3, starting in verse 12. Because God wants to know, wants his people to know that there is a chance for forgiveness. There's a chance that you can come back to me. There's a way, there's a time, there's going to be a future moment where I will restore my people. All is not lost. All is not broken. You may go to slavery today, but freedom is coming tomorrow. You may face death today, but life is coming tomorrow. And so God gives them hope because he is a never-ending fountain. So look at chapter 3 of Jeremiah, starting in verse 12. It says, Go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return, faithless Israel, declares the Lord. I will not look on you in anger, for I am merciful, declares the Lord. I will not be angry forever. Only acknowledge your guilt 
that you rebelled against the Lord your God and scattered your favors among foreigners under every green tree and that you have not obeyed my voice, declares the Lord. Return, O faithless children, declares the Lord, for I am your master. I will take you one from a city and two from a family and I will bring you to Zion and I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. And when you have multiplied and been faithful in the land, in those days, declares the Lord, they shall no more say, the ark of the covenant of the Lord, it shall not come to mind or be remembered or missed. It shall not be made again. At that time, Jerusalem shall be called the throne of the Lord. The throne of the Lord and all nations shall gather to it to the presence of the Lord in Jerusalem, and they shall no more stubbornly follow their own evil heart. In those days, the house of Judah shall join the house of Israel, and together they shall come from the land of the north to the land that I gave your fathers for a heritage. See, God, He's telling them to return. Yes, they were sinful. Yes, they rejected Him. But God is a God of mercy. And He will forgive their double evil. He will call them out of their unfaithfulness. And He will wash them clean and make them new. He says, though you have rejected Me, I have not rejected you. And it doesn't just go back to the way it was. Notice that if you can read through that paragraph once or twice. It's not just like, okay, I'll bring you back and it'll be back normal. It's going to be better. God says, hey, this ark that we've had in the temple and the tabernacle, we're not going to need to build that again. This place where I would come and dwell uniquely and the priests would only come in once a year and there was all these rules and regulations around it. He goes, we don't need that anymore. When I come back again, we'll call Jerusalem my throne and I will sit with my people and rule them intimately. And you will see me and I will be your God and you will be my people. God says, it's going to be way better. We're not going to need all this other stuff. I'm just going to come be with you. He's going to fix it right. And so there is hope for the people of Jerusalem and there is hope for us today. Even if you find yourself eating the dust out of a broken cistern, Let me invite you this morning to find the fountain of forgiveness, love, joy, peace, and belonging that can only be found. And where you and your heart and soul can only be ever satisfied in God, our Lord Jesus Christ. See, the good news of the Gospel is that the fountain is still flowing. You can still hear it. You can still see it. The fountain is flowing and the universe is waiting and watching. The stars, they may stand appalled right now at our behavior, about our sin and brokenness. They are shocked by our unfaithfulness. Yet they once were shocked by the love of God when He sent Jesus Christ to come to this earth the Creator of all things who's holding them together is now walking around as a little man on this speck of dust in the cosmos. And they watched as Jesus grew and He became a man and taught and led. And they were curious of what is He up to? What is God as a man going to do? I'm sure the heavens were appalled even more when they saw God's own people reject Him once again. God in their midst. And they said, no thank you. In fact, they wanted nothing to do with Him. So they accused Him of all kinds of false things. They whipped Him. They beat Him. They pulled out His beard. When they put that crown of thorns on His head, What did the stars think of us then? 
when we're mocking him and bowing down, oh, hail King of the Jews. And the stars are like, you better watch it. That is the King of the universe. What do you think you're doing? And then they stand shocked and appalled as we nail him to a cross. And he gives up his life for us, the unfaithful ones. So then the stars, I don't know how they dimmed for a short season. But they watch for three days. But then I think they stand in even greater awe of God's mercy and power when Jesus Christ bursts out of that tomb and He rises from the dead. And then He offers forgiveness and freedom and life to all who would turn to Him. And the heavens declare His glory and majesty and they sing His praise forever. Listen to these few verses this morning out of Revelation where Jesus declares that He is the fountain and He is still flowing. And so if you can hear His voice, there is a chance for you to be satisfied. Today, you can turn to Him, the fountain of life, and find Him. This is out of Revelation 21 and 22. Jesus says, And he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage and I will be his God and he will be my son. Jesus Christ is declaring that he is the fountain and through the gospel message, he wants you to know that the fountain is flowing all the stronger. It's on full force and it's coming for you. And it's so strong, it's going to flood. It's going to keep coming out, and it's going to flow out of here. Listen to chapter 22 of Revelation. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life. Now it's not some little stream. We got a river coming. It's bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city also, On either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it. And His servants will worship Him. They will see His face and His name will be on their foreheads. And night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun. For the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. The river of God's mercy and grace and love for you is flowing. And it's flowing strong. And the heavens are waiting for your response. Do we see the fountain and reject it once again? and go dig out of our broken cisterns looking for water that will never be there and will never satisfy? Will we reject it once again? Or will today, will today we surrender to the Lord and say, yes, I'm thirsty. Can I have your water? I come to you and I find forgiveness. I find your grace and your mercy. I need it. I know that what I've done has been shameful and appalling to the stars. And just like Jerusalem of old, I've committed those evils time and time again. And I've looked for meaning and purpose within myself and not in you. But Lord, today, today overwhelm me with your flood of forgiveness 
and mercy and grace and give me the life that I so desperately need. And when you do that, the heavens will change their tune. And they will not stand in shock and awe over your sin any longer. Instead, the heavens will declare God's mercy on your life and you will cause them to sing. Jesus said that the angels rejoice over one sinner who repents. And joining with the angels are all the stars in the sky. First Chronicles 16 says this, Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice and let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for He comes to judge the earth. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. So if you're going to cause the stars to sing, let's change their tune to a tune of joy. Let's get them to rejoice over your repentance and faith like the centurion of old. Because just like Hosea went and sought his unfaithful bride, Gomer, and brings her home to himself, the Lord is our faithful husband, and he has come to bring you back to himself. Make today the day that you choose to follow him, and you receive this fountain of life that will forever satisfy your soul and bring joy to you, to the angels, and to all the stars in heaven, including Billy. Let's pray and thank God for this forever flowing fountain. Let's pray. Lord, this is just a word picture that you gave to your people and to us. The reality is so much bigger. Lord, we first apologize for our sin. We beg for forgiveness. For even now, many of us, myself included, often ignore the water that you are, the life that you have, and we go seeking after other things. Worshiping the gods of wealth or popularity or purpose or the God of ourselves. Lord, we've rejected you time and time again, but you have not rejected us. Thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. Thank you for the forgiveness in your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the gospel that he gives to us that whoever we are, wherever we are, whatever we've done, this fountain is available to us. Lord, thank you. And may we join with the stars in heaven and the angels by, we, by your side and rejoice over your goodness and faithfulness. And may we do that forevermore by the river of life that flows from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.